All right. Let me call to order the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency meeting for uh, today, January 25th. If you'll please rise. I'm going to ask uh, Board of Supervisor Chairman Sargosa if you'll lead us, please. Please follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, very good. Um, roll call. Chair Mulhart? Here. Director Craven? Here. Director Zaragoza? Here. Director McIntyre? Here. Director Borchard? Here. Okay, and uh, Dan Nauman, where is Dan? Oh, there he is. Is an alternate, uh, is in the audience. Sam, um, Mike Kelly is caught up in that big auto accident on 118, I think, uh, between... Rice and uh, Rose, the road shut down. So when he comes, we're going to swap out again. And uh, Dave Schwabauer is also an alternate, so we've got that. Oh, uh, yes, I apologize. Yes, Neil is here as well. I think we have. And uh, by the way, uh, John is now the primary to the GMA, and uh, Steve is Steve, now the Steve alternate. alternate. So they made that change last night. So we need to make that change as well. Mm -hmm. uh, agenda review, please. Uh, just one item, Chair. We'd like to ask, uh, due to time constraints um, of the speaker, that you move item five up to the top of the agenda. Okay. When you can. I think that's their presentation is being loaded. Okay. All right. Any other changes to the agenda? Uh, any objection? Uh, hearing none, so moved. Uh, public comments. Opportunity for the public to address the GMA. First of the year. Yes, sir. Thank you. Burke Perler, resident of Oxnard. I would like to ask if your board has given direction to the staff. There was a recent article, a multi-page article in the Star with respect to water and how it expects the state, but there was a line in there by the reporter, staff reporter for the Star based out of Sacramento, that the Ventura County was fortunate that it had abundant water supplies. Does that not conflict with the issue of apparently the city of Oxnard, not the city of Oxnard, the uh, Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency is reporting that there's a 30% overdraft been going on for a period of time. If it's not in conflict, um, it doesn't seem that there should be a response. But if it is in conflict with what the report gave to the public, I think that the board should go with some direction to their staff to let the public know what's going on with the water. Is there an abundant? We're fortunate to have an abundant, and there is no overdraft, or is there an overdraft, and it causes us to possibly question the fortunate of being abundant water supply. Thank you. Okay. All right, staff's heard the comment. Look into it. Give us some advice. Uh, anybody else have any comments? Dr. B. Uh, as you know, you know we've been having um, issues with the recycled water that's uh, been high in salts that have come down the Santa Clara River from L.A. County. Um, we thought we had all worked out um, an arrangement uh, on a project to take care of those high salts, um, and then the Santa Clarita um, Sanitation District, which is a part of the L.A. County Sanitation Districts, uh, voted down the funds for that about a year ago. They are now come back with an, another project that was not worked out with stakeholders, um, and they're going to, they just had a... Uh, uh, a release of uh, wanting information on what kinds of things they should be covered in the EIR that they're going to do on this project. So um, that I suggest that uh, I'm certainly going to be writing something for United Water related to that. And uh, so uh, if you, I, we certainly encourage everyone to do it. What they're talking about is basically um, doing uh, reverse osmosis and reusing a lot of that water less water coming down the river for us. We're not sure the quantities, but it could be in the, in the multi-thousands, maybe even the tens of thousands of acre feet that would come out of the Santa Clara River in the future. Okay. Are, are you aware of that report, staff? Is staff aware of that report? Yes, we got the same notice. Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Let's deal with uh, board member comments. Um, the only quick comment I'll make is uh, Bob Aranio, as you know, has been the uh, president of United Water Conservation District for the last two years in our normal cycle change. Uh, 
Robert's tenure is up. Dan Nauman is now the president of the uh, United Water Conservation District, so I congratulate uh, Dan on that and thank Bob for his work. And also, uh, as I said earlier, John is now the primary to the GMA, and Steve Bennett uh, is the alternate. And John was just appointed uh, chairman of the uh, Board of Supervisors. So that's right. Congratulations on all that. Thank you, Nguyen. Thank okay. you. All righty. Anybody else have any comments? All right. Let's go to the consent item. The approval of amendments. Okay. Any uh, objection? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, so moved. Okay. Which uh, item? Which is the item we're going to move up? Item five. Okay, so let's move item five up, and uh, let's go ahead and deal with that issue. Uh, Gerhard. Uh, Gerhard Hubner, Watershed Protection District. My honor to uh, present or do the introduction for this item. Today we have uh, Shauna Epstein, the general manager for Ventura Water, uh, who will do a presentation and update on some of the projects that they're working on. Uh, Ms. Epstein, prior to becoming Ventura Water's first general manager in May 2010, served for seven years as the environmental utilities manager for the city of Beverly Hills, where she led a staff of more than 70 employees and was responsible for overseeing water, wastewater, solid waste, and stormwater services. Previously, she worked in the public utilities department in the city of Anaheim. Ms. Epstein holds a master's degree in public administration from George Washington University, and a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite her to come up, and hopefully we get that presentation working. Yes. So um, we're going to start with a video of our whole estuary settlement, and I, one of, I'm assuming maybe you are not one of the 400 people who have already viewed this video on YouTube. <laughs> but uh, one of the reasons we wanted to show this to you is because I know um, many of us are dealing with how do we communicate with our customers. And so this is a very um, big topic for us uh, that costs a lot of money for the future. And so this is how we try to really communicate to our customers, and we got a lot of positive feedback. So we okay. we'll start with that. Thank you. On this earth, our community is bordered by the Ventura River to the north, the Santa Clara River to the south, and looking west is the Pacific Ocean and the Channel Islands. These bodies of water are pearls of great beauty and home to diverse and natural ecosystems and habitats. We too rely on this water for drinking, recreation, and to support our economic vitality. In this video, we'll talk about Ventura's water and what's happening today to protect our natural environment and ways we can use our limited water resources more wisely in the future. In August 2011, Ventura Water, the operator of the City of Ventura's Municipal Water and Wastewater Utilities, entered into a historic agreement with environmental and public interest organizations Heal the Bay, Wishtoyo Foundation, and Wishtoyo Foundation's Ventura Coastkeeper Program. This agreement will create a solution to a long-standing concern. Before we talk about that, let's start with some basics about Ventura's water resources. Water and wastewater. Ventura is one of California's oldest coastal cities and one of the largest that relies completely on local water sources for its drinking water. Water we receive from the Ventura River, Lake Casitas, and numerous groundwater wells. Water used in homes and businesses, then flows through a 290-mile collection system to the community's sole treatment plant, the Ventura Water Reclamation Facility, located between the Ventura Harbor and the Santa Clara River. This plant uses a three-step process called tertiary treatment to clean between seven to nine million gallons of wastewater every day. This water must meet strict regulations for cleanliness before it enters a system of wildlife ponds or is diverted to reclaim water uses. Currently, only about 3% of the water is used to irrigate nearby golf courses and commercial landscaping. The other 97% travels through the wildlife ponds for about four days, 
before its release to the Santa Clara River estuary, where the river meets the Pacific Ocean. Over the decades, Ventura has invested almost $100 million in the wastewater facility to meet increasingly stringent regulations as set by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. The concern. While it's a complex question, the simple fact is that there are different viewpoints about how this highly treated wastewater is impacting the natural habitats and ecosystems of the estuary. Ongoing studies are currently being conducted to try to answer this question scientifically. Heal the Bay in which Toil Foundation's Ventura Coastkeeper Program pursued legal and administrative actions because they are concerned that the treated water may be harming the sensitive estuary habitat. The settlement solution. Over a number of months, the three parties worked together to craft an innovative plan and settlement that will provide long-term benefits to the environment and to Ventura's water supply. I'm Bill Fulton, the mayor of the city of Ventura. I'm Mark Gold, president of the environmental group Heal the Bay. I'm Jason Weiner, associate director and staff attorney of Wishtoyo Foundation's Ventura Coastkeeper Program. Matiwaya, Executive Director of Wishtoyo Foundation and Ceremonial Elder Shumesh Pibon. This settlement was based on the idea that by using common goals and the best available science, we could together find a solution. The agreement lays out a process with defined milestones and dates to ensure that we continue to move forward. Here are the key points. The agreement puts Ventura Water on track to recycle as much as 100% and a minimum of 50% of the water. While the estuary studies are still being conducted, we have been able to agree that recycling as much tertiary treated water as possible is an enormous benefit to the environment and Ventura's water resources. By using this reclaimed water for landscaping or for other uses, instead of tapping into our domestic water supply, we will also be helping to secure, stretch, and minimize the costs of our long-term water supply. The water that doesn't get recycled will be discharged to a treatment wetland to be constructed later and to provide further cleansing of the treated wastewater. Then, the water will flow through the wetland before being discharged directly to the estuary. Ventura Water's operations and capital projects are completely funded by the rates paid by our customers. Under the terms of this legal agreement, the total cost of this project is capped at $55 million. Early estimates indicate that this may cost about $3.50 per month per average household until 2055. A new cost of service and rate design study for water and wastewater rates is being conducted now. One of the tasks will be to look at the options available to us to pay for this effort over time. We have agreed to work closely together throughout the entire process and use the best available science to make the most responsible decisions. Our community appreciates the natural beauty of Ventura. The creation of a more solid and integrated working relationship between us and the environmental community will help us all protect our fragile, interrelated, and precious water resources. We partnered with all Venturans in this important project to protect the ecology of the estuary and the Santa Clara River watershed, to protect the Southern California steelhead, and to protect all of the estuary's threatened and endangered native species that play an integral role in the city's and county's economic, social, and environmental well-being. This agreement also creates new opportunities to use more reclaimed water in additional ways that benefit our wider community, such as for agriculture, for groundwater recharge, or to combat seawater from contaminating our groundwater supplies. It's a win for the city, it's a win for the county, and it's a win for the watershed's residents, businesses, and visitors. At a time when water supplies are becoming increasingly scarce, this unique settlement provides many benefits. It will resolve a decade of disagreement about the ecological impacts of discharges on the estuary and protect it for the future. It will also position Ventura as a true leader in integrated water management. In the long run, the investment in our water resources will pay financial as well as environmental dividends. This important settlement will not only protect the cultural resources of the Shumish people on the Santa Clara River, but the natural resources and the birthright of all Ventura County residents. Hi, I'm Shauna Epstein, Ventura Waters General Manager, and I'd like to take a few minutes to explain to you the process that we're going to embark upon over the next 15 years. To protect the ecology of the estuary, we will together establish a process and a schedule to determine how much tertiary treated water should be diverted and how much can continue to be released through a treatment wetland. 
This in turn will direct how we establish a technical process and schedule to select a preferred infrastructure alternative or alternatives to accomplish these goals. The settlement identifies that we will complete design, environmentally review, and obtain all necessary permits and construct the diversion infrastructure by 2025. This includes having the funding sources in place to financially support the overall project. This settlement sets us in a new direction. So you may ask yourself, why today? Why in this economy should I support this? It is clear that finding the optimum amount of water and the best treatment to protect the sensitive habitat of the Santa Clara River estuary is imperative. It is our responsibility to protect the habitat that is home to a substantial number of sensitive shoreline and wetland invertebrate fish and avian and terrestrial species, including Tidewater goby, Southern California steelhead, Western snow plover, and the California least churn. Up to 60% of our drinking water is used to irrigate landscaping. Today, our reclamation facility treats and releases to the estuary between seven to nine million gallons of highly treated water every day. We must develop new opportunities to use this readily available water for non-drinking uses. This will allow us and other water providers to leave more water in the Ventura River and regional groundwater basins where it will help support our natural environment and be available to the human population during times of drought or other restrictions. And by using reclaimed water more widely, we can delay or even avoid having to establish expensive new water sources, such as desalination or importing state water from Northern California. All of us have a special relationship with water. It's part of our daily lives and we cannot afford to take it for granted. Our decision today will impact generations to follow. So be a part of our water future. Learn what you can do at VenturaWater.net. Now we leave you with this Shumash proverb. Let's invest in a future that we may never see, but the health of our children will depend upon it. That is the birthright. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. So, TV star. I didn't know we had a TV star. Yeah, yeah. it's a great video. And <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand to watch myself at it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they're bringing up that's number four hundred and one. Yes, that, that was a, well. No, we we're on, not on the YouTube side. I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> I tried that, but Gerhard didn't like that idea. <laughs> So uh, today we're here to talk about the Santa Clara River Estuary. I believe the last time we were here, we talked about a recycling um, feasibility study that we were doing, and that is actually part of what we're moving forward with, with the Santa Clara River Estuary Agreement and moving forward, and our overall goals with our water efficiency program. It's a five-year program. Um, why we got here, we actually have a discharge permit that was released us for two, 2008. And that caused uh, major environmental concerns, so much so that Heal the Bay uh, tried to appeal the, the permit to the State Water Control Board at the same time which Toya Foundation um, filed a lawsuit using federal laws against us for, um, that we're not allowed to release to an estuary. So uh, we took that to opportunity to actually have a three-party agreement versus um, trying to deal with each party individually to come to some kind of resolution and start using our resources uh, proactively versus fighting each other. Uh, the, what I like to bottom line the settlement agreement is it gave us goals, it gave us a process, and it gave us a, cu a cap of costs. And um, what we really feel is it bought us a lot of time to do it right and to do and not have to be forced into taking water out of the estuary without a good solid plan and where we needed to go and what's best for our water future. Uh, and so we went over these different um, elements. We're going to go over the um, the timeline has a lot different aspects and we don't really have to, um, I'm going to go into that aspect, but we don't have to actually know how much we're not going to discharge into the estuary until 2018. So, um, and so we'll go through the different studies that we're going to go through that process. 
Uh, we're right now in um, putting together the, fees, the studies for phase two and phase three, and this will really flesh out more of the recycled water. I'm asking actually for a business plan and for us to include what not only um, what we can do with reuse as the normal traditional items that we've done talked about reuse, but also direct potable reuse because this does provide us a lot of planning out and so to look at that as we move forward. Uh, so when we were here last time we talked about the recycled water market study, uh, we've already initiated a further study of how we could work with the city of Oxnard. Um, we're talking about the, Craig and I talked more about the different elements of the recycled. The wetlands feasibility study, we have new sites that we could put the wetlands, so we're putting that into the study. Um, we sent uh, this revised report from the estuary synthesis that many of the people in this room serve as stakeholders that we've talked about all the different species, what could happen at different levels of the diversion of the flow being removed from the Santa Clara River estuary, and, um, and that has already been sent to the Regional Water Quality Control Board. We, um, our next permit is up in 2013, so we need to, um, with each, we, during this process, we have three different permits processes to go through with the Regional Water Quality Control Board for discharge. So during all of these processes, we still have to prove enhancement as well as keep moving forward to a new solution. So these are the key dates. As I said, 2018, we just actually determined the diversion flow. Uh, we select um, infrastructure at that time shortly after. Um, the key here is we have to, um, the target is to get all of our permits issued by 2021. If we, I mean, by 2020. If we don't have our issue, permits issued by 2021, then there's um, mechanisms in the settlement for us to have the project delayed uh, past being implemented by 2025. So the funding is capped at $55 million in current dollars. Uh, there's different um, ways and escalators in there, and I always say the fun part of that is to really just read the definitions in the settlement agreement. We are actively pursuing grant funding. There's a lot of different elements out there um, with the Bureau of Reclamation that we can pursue as, because this is part of our whole water efficiency program of using recycled water as a viable resource. And so we're making every effort to hedge some of those costs with that, um, as well as if we can offset some by the reclaimed water sales. So we really feel the benefits of this settlement is this is we need to do something um, for our water supply and to ensure it for the long run as well as um, and so this plays into that role and we have a good timeline and we put a price cap on it so um, that it doesn't get we don't lose complete control of the situation. Uh, one of the aspects that was very different about this is typically settlements are just done in closed session. And our council asked that there be a 120-day outreach period before they actually confirm it in a public meeting. And so these is, we did a tremendous amount. We had websites. We had our newsletter. Um, we actually liked the pipeline newsletter title and then realized that's what you use in the county. Uh, so there's two pipelines. Uh, we had a town hall that about 50 people came to. Um, we have a number of press le releases with actual news coverage and articles. Uh, our city manager has a blog that's very active, and so he used that. And, um, and we went to different community meetings to talk about this. So thousands of people were reached of our customer base and to, with this information, and five people showed up to the council meeting for its approval. And so the big picture of where, how this fits in with Fox Canyon is there's lots of opportunities for collaboration of using this water resource and having another viable resource out there as we integrate water resources and, as, um, and that enhances our own supply as well as the region's supply. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes, just a quick question, uh, Ashana. The, uh, you said you're working with the city of Oxnard to, to treat the water or... We're looking at with the, working with the city of Oxnard on different um, avenues. That, so either we could, they could treat the water and put in the system, um, and or you know we're looking at all the different feasibilities of what we could do. Mm -hmm. So the water sent over to Oxnard and is treated, and then and then what? what 
it, it, we're working that out. Oh, there's we're, no, we're not there yet. There's nothing we're walking away with that we're doing at this point. And, and the other quick question is, I've been, you probably discussed it in the past, is the water is being uh, diverted or, or recycled and so forth. I saw some agriculture there, some trees and so forth. Can we use that water for J. Rogay down? Ag? We, um, some of that water can be used for agriculture. Some of the water will have to be treated to a different level so that it can be used for agriculture, and that's all part of acceptance from that's the agricultural community as well as um, us community. getting the treatment levels correct. And that's what I was, you know, thinking is, will the ag community accept it and will the public accept it? Is that part of your... Uh, that's part of this whole communication whole that we all need to be part of, that it's a viable resource. It's the same water that's been here since the beginning of time. And essentially, we're all using reused water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Mm -hmm. um, to the audience? <laughs> Robert Aranio with Crestview Mutual Water Company. Um, as I sit here and listen, excellent presentation, but the first thing that jumped into my mind was uh, some of the things that we've uh, dealt with and are dealing with at United, for instance. $55 million seems like a almost reasonable amount given the top of dollars that we're looking at for various projects that we have to undertake. What happens if the solution or solutions turns out to be greater than $55 million? What is, what is in place to get you from what you are capped at to where you need to go? Okay. So it's $55 million in current dollars. There's also in there... Um, uh, that we can, for what we can increase rates by as much as no more than 3% of the overall customer base rates um, and, and in the, each year. And that the rates, their rates can no, cannot be more than 1.2% uh, um, of their median income. So um, there's different factors built in there. Uh, but in addition, um, the goal is that um, if the project it, it's also an off-ramp in the settlement if the project becomes um, ex too costly and there's different ways to come back and, and come back to the table on that. Okay. All right, very good. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. You have to come up for the record with your name. Hi, Steve Nash. I'm resident of Oxnard. And are, are you looking to um, ship some of the water to Oxnard's advanced water purification facility? That's part of the feasibility study, yeah. Because right now the um, the uh, AWPF will be built in four phases. Each phase, I think, will be capable of, of uh, handling six and a quarter million gallons a day, I believe, um, and that will be water that that's uh, the, the effluent from our wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and the um, the current the current uh, average daily flow of the plant is probably you know 25 to 30 million gallons a day. So I'm not I'm not even at full build out. I'm not seeing a lot of room to handle uh, Ventura's water. So that will certainly be um, an issue that that, that needs to be uh, dealt with. Also the uh, the projected cost of water from the uh, AWPF uh, it's project it's projecting out to be one to two thousand dollars an acre foot. So that's that's a uh, you know that, that that's a huge expense. Although I do, you know, I do do agree that this water is is, is a potential source to uh, put into our um, ASR wells and uh, use that to build actual um, storage credits from uh, for, for the GMA. So, okay, all right. Um, yeah. First of all, anybody else have any other questions? Uh, as a quick comment, I thought the video was brilliant. And your acting is superb. I, you know, Thank you. I, you know, I just wanted to pass that on to you. So I'm sure there'll be letters from the Academy shortly. <laughs> but um, I, I think that um, the outreach process that you folks have gone through, the outreach process that you've gone through, has, uh, has, has been an example. And it's an example I think we could use at United. Um, and it may be for a lot of things we have to do at United. And eventually, in some of the areas we're going to talk about today, the the Los Postas Basin Users Group, uh, it may be that we have to actually use all the techniques that are now available and tools that are available to now uh, available to us to, to get the message out there. So I applaud you and the city of Ventura for your outreach process. I think that's really 
Uh, these settlements are complicated, and it's like you've decided to, to go to New York, and you're only about a mile down the road. I understand that. And it's going to be a long process, but the key is you've put a process in play. And um, we're doing that at United. We're doing that in the uh, Los Postas area. We're going to do that again on the Oxnard Plain. So the outreach, I think, was very impressive. So thanks for that. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments? Okay. I know you have to run to a meeting. Thank so you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, back to item number uh, two. Rick. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Molhart, members of the board. For the record, Rick Beergoots, Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. I'll be presenting item number two today, and Mary Lentz from IT Services is here, and she will also present a demo of the software for you. So I'm going to provide a little bit of background, and then I'm going to go over some of the challenges with the project. You know, the project had a, a deadline of well over a year ago, and as you know, it, it uh, is just coming to completion now, and so I understand there are some questions about what some of the challenges and delays arose from. So I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So let me get going. Uh, September 2009, your board directed us to move forward with county IT services to develop a new software application. And the, you can see the bullet items up there. The goal is to streamline business processes and provide more consistent processes mm -hmm. for calculating and collecting extraction charges upgrade the technology and automation security, and really move to a new software application that more than just GMA staff can use, one that operators can use, owners can use, and additional GMA staff can use. So uh, the new system is designed so owners and operators can access it via the internet. It's called a dot, .NET application, and it wouldn't be unlike another utility account that somebody might have and access through the Internet. On the website, they can do the extraction reporting, payment, manage their account information, so name, address, email, that type of thing, upload meter calibration data when it's required, photos of the meter can be uploaded, the meter calibration sheet can be uploaded, serial numbers, things like that. Required information can be done uh, over the internet. Uh, operators can get access to reports such as ex extraction history and credits, payment history, and workflow for applications can be tracked. And the system's integrated with online payments or, or ePay and also the geographic information system. For the FCGMA staff perspective, we can also better see due dates and responses for meter calibration we can hone in much more quickly on when accounts are past due and when operators fail to report extractions on time. That's really important. As you know, we've, we've wrestled with a number of legacy issues over the years, and in order to eliminate those moving forward, we need to be more proactive and identify those issues earlier. Uh, so the current state, the new system is in use. We call it FCGMA Online. Uh, it's more straightforward than what we have now. Uh, for instance, Miranda, Sheila, Kathleen, myself, we have a number of people using the system now. It's more straightforward for reporting, payments, irrigation efficiency. And so it's working well. But we had a lot of challenges getting here today. And so I'm going to go over those key challenges next. So we had a number of data and coding challenges. And essentially... When we took the data from the GMA database, and I'm using very simplistic speaking, we, we copied it and we pasted it into the new software application, and it didn't always work. You can imagine the GMA database is very complex, and within it, it has a number of operator accounts, and many of those operator accounts have some sort of story to them where payments weren't remitted, reporting wasn't done, something wasn't correct. And so when we moved that information into the new system, it wasn't able to calculate it because the data wasn't there or it was incorrect. So those are data errors, and we had a ton of them. Uh, we also did quite a few, well, we did three, 
parallel system tests, but there's a lot of work involved in those. Those take time. They're triggered every six months as part of the semi-annual extraction reporting process. And essentially staff would print out the reports from the existing database and from the new system, compare them where they didn't match. We would flag it, catalog it, put it in a spreadsheet, and follow up on it. Big effort. And um, it's, it's paid off, though, and it's the right way to, it's one of the right ways to make sure that the quality is there. And in late November, early December, we did the last parallel system test. We identified some additional data issues. Those have been identified, and we're chipping away at those. Uh, the board letter mentions we had about a 19% fallout from the last parallel system test. And since then, we found that that number is made up uh, in some cases of uh, cases where the Microsoft Access database we're using wasn't correct, but the new system was correct. So that's encouraging. Um, we've also got some data issues, some issues where the data wasn't synced up properly. One of the things we've been doing over the last year and a half is we've been using the GMA database as normal, but we've also been using the new system in parallel. So when we make changes to the GMA database, we need to make those changes to the new system. But sometimes those changes didn't get made, so some things were out of sync, and that represents why some of these later data issues occurred. And the new system also has some stricter business rules. So it can be, um, it, it looks, at, looks at the data a little bit more carefully than the last system does. And sometimes that represented a hiccup in it. Coding. So coding issues are normal in these types of software development processes, but we had some very uh, complex coding issues come about as part of it. Uh, early on, and even towards the end, some of those coding issues were difficult to separate between coding, whether or not the formulas were correct, and whether or not the data was correct. And either way, it took a lot of effort to determine what was causing the issue and how to fix it. We also had some issues where coding fixes didn't stick or they didn't go as far as we needed them to, and then those were identified at a later date. E-commerce was another big challenge for the agency and, and I think for the, the county as well. It required significant time. During development of the GMA application, the county was also developing a new system, they call it an enterprise contract, and new policies to basically synchronize the way the county handles electronic payments. And so it was a big effort on the county side, completely independent of what we were doing at the GMA. We needed to wait for that process to be completed, then approach the auditor and treasurer and get our system hooked in, and that's what we did. So they needed to work through their issues before they could tackle our issues. That's done now, and they've approved the GMA process. We also had issues, technical issues, with our fiscal, fiscal staff. They needed certain information when it came to ePay. ePay is relatively new for, for certain groups in the county, and they had a, a number of questions. Right now, the way it works is the electronic payments will be deposited right into the treasury. But in the past, there was a paper trail, there was tracking, there were things, checks and balances. So we had to develop the checks and balances for the new online system. When people use the new system to pay online, the money goes right into the county treasury. It circumvents that paper intensive sort of manual process that we have. And the new system will produce a report showing how it was done. Fiscal had questions, what happens if an account or if, if an attempt to pay fails, how do we track that? How do we reconcile that? Important issues. We also needed to redivide or redesign some web pages, some printed pages, to give the fiscal group the information they needed so they could handle it during audits. GIS. Another timing issue. We had a timing issue with ePay where the county was undertaking a new effort similar timing issue with GIS. Uh, prior to the development of the GMA online system, the county undertook an effort, the county GIS group undertook an effort to plan for a major upgrade to their services. Well, 
we needed to come in line with what they were doing. They needed to finish their work first, and then we needed to have their system um, programmed so it did what we needed it to do, including things like for irrigation efficiency, people can log on, measure the acreage of their parcels, they can print maps, upload those maps. And, of course, there were other issues with uh, firewall servers and security certificates that are part of that type of process. So that summarizes the, the key challenges that we've had. Additionally, we've incorporated the tier surcharge structure, which wasn't part of the original project. As you recall, of course, we're moving on to a new tiered surcharge structure for this year, or for 2011. So that required new coding, new web page looks, um, and um, new printed forms. Just some minor modifications to show how the new surcharge was or is collected. And, of course, testing of that. Throughout the entire process, we've operated the GMA database as usual. Uh, but throughout the process, or as part of the process, we've learned a lot more about how that system has, has worked or the information has spread more among the staff than it used to be. You know, keep in mind, in the past, Sheila, our engineering technician, has been the primary person operating that. So as part of this development, we've all learned a lot more about the system. We've also identified issues with GMA Online throughout the process. And as a result, both GMA staff and IT services staff is much more familiar with the system, with what we've done in the past and clearly how that links to how we're doing it in the future. So that's good moving forward. I mentioned data issues. A lot of these data issues required an awful lot of work to go into the accounts and clean them up. As a result, we've essentially audited a large number of the GMA accounts, and that's, that's positive. That gives us more confidence moving forward. Uh, we just finished uh, working with the new set of auditors, and I can tell you that their audit was more detail than we've seen in the past. So having more detail in our new system is, is important, and it's going to be useful for us. They've asked us questions, you know, why wasn't a surcharge levied on this account back in this time frame? So we've had to go in and identify the responses to those. In the new system, it'll be more straightforward. Uh, we've also kept the commitment to get it right. Uh, there's, there's never been any, any doubt about that. And the development budget for the software application did not increase. And, Mary, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then I've got a concluding slide. And I think what Mary's going to do is, well, I'll let Mary explain it, <laughs> since she's the pro with this stuff. Okay, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves there. Uh, I want to thank the board for having me today. I'd like to give a demonstration of the online system. As Rick mentioned, we've been working on this system for quite a long time. We've had a lot of uh, challenges along the way, but I think that the, the end product of what we're about to display is, is uh, really going to bring a lot to the agency and to the operators. And um, we had a technical difficulty with the podium today, so I have a, a Oz up in the control room who's going to be running through the screens for me. So, Scott, if you could bring up the... Uh, the display? Um, Mary, if I can interrupt for a second, because it's recorded and for the record, if, just for the record, put your name and uh, um, what division you're with with the county. My pleasure. My name is Mary Lentz. I'm with IT Services okay. for the county. Right, thanks. Of yeah, but, and if you pull the mics a little together, you're, okay. you speak softly, so that'll help. Yeah, there we go. Good. Is that better? Yes, yeah. better. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. Scott, if you could bring up the display for me, please. Maybe. Are they in a huddle? We're getting a computer system together. <laughs> okay. Miranda, call. call uh, Scott, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, she started. Can I ask Nick yeah. a question? Yeah. 
Oh, there it is. Okay, okay hold on. Here we go. Okay. Thank you, Scott. If you could log in for me, please. Uh, what I'd like to show you today is I'm logging in as if I'm an operator in the agency, and what I can see here is I've logged in as, a, as an operator. The security for this operator's account is set based on his username and password, so once he's logged in, all the menus, all the amounts due, all the applications, all the historical records are um, associated with just this operator. Um, what I can see in the menus, Scott, if you could go over the, the application menu, please, is these are particular applications that this account as an operator and a grower is allowed to submit. So he can, he can apply for a baseline application. He can do an assignment of a baseline allocation from himself to another operator. And he, if, because this account is also an owner, he can authorize another operator to extract from these different wells. And Scott, can you go to the reports menu, please? On the reports menu for the operators, they are, there's a few reports that we've put into this that used to be uh, a report that you would have to request from the agency. And one of them is the annual credit summary. Scott, if you can go in there, please. And select your com code and, and any year. And generate the report. This is one of the reports that an operator would have to request from the Fox Canyon Ground Water Agency. And it shows all of the extractions for this particular account each well it shows the um, adjusted amount the historical allocations and at some point it, down at the bottom it's going to calculate the um, available credits and allocations less the extractions and show the credit balance for that year so you can close that please and under reports there's also an extraction history by year we go into there. This is going to show all of the extractions for all of the wells associated with this account from the beginning of the reporting for this particular account. And in this one, we can see that the, the reporting started in 2000. So all this historical data is what uh, Rick Vergutz was talking about when he was saying that we, we literally migrated all the data that we had and made it available to all the operators. So what we show here is we've got the, the wells, the extractions, the reduction percents, all of the credits in lieu transfers, historical allocations, all of that, and down to the pumping fee that was in effect at the time and the fees due for that particular year. So I think it gives a pretty good history and transparency into all the records for each account that's going to be available to the operators. Close that, please. And the ETO annual summary, this is something that, that uh, most operators will recognize. Um, this is a, a summary that's typically sent out by Sheila in the, the agency where it's got the allowed water for each type of crop. Now she, she puts this data into the new system by instead of mailing out this piece of paper, but more importantly, all these, all these figures for the rainwater and the allowed water and all of that feed directly into the irrigation efficiency calculations. So the operator no longer has to go and try and calculate their own percentage on the irrigation efficiency. He types in the amount of, of uh, acreage and the crops that he's watering, and it's going to calculate his percentage. So you can close that, please. And going back to the operator's home page, Can we scroll down, please? Down here we've got all the wells associated with the com codes. It's got uh, the semi-annual summary below that towards the bottom of the page. If we could go into one of the wells, please. What I'm seeing here is the extractions available for each well. A little bit of the information about the wells, as much as we know about the well. Uh, then I can see all the extractions. If you could uh, select all on the year code, please. Other side. Up above the, the extractions for the wells. 
what I can see here is all the extractions for this particular well. And as opposed to the screen before where we were looking at all the extractions for the entire ComCode account. And scroll down, please. What we show here is we show any parcel numbers that are being watered by this well, the current operators that are running this well, and then we've got the ability to go in and, and file your meter calibrations and add meters to this well. So if you could click on add meter calibration, please. Okay, from this screen we can see that uh, there's a couple different meters that we can go into. We selected a particular meter. This is some basic information on it. it can, we can activate, inactivate meters so that the semi-annual statement picks up the correct meter for the calculations. It's got uh, whatever information the agency has on this meter. But most importantly, um, you can change the units of measure on your meters as needed so that it feeds into the calculations and brings in the correct divisors and multiplizers there. Okay, close that, please. And scroll up. Most of the records that are available for each operator are under current notifications. Um, what we see under current notifications right now, we can see that there's a semi-annual extraction due date coming up um, in March of 2012. It's not past due, and currently there is a surcharge on here, on this particular account. The reason why that is showing is because before this meeting, I wanted to make sure that we had enough data to show you, so I, I started a semi-annual statement for 2012, 2011-2, and made sure that it incurred a surcharge so that we could look at the irrigation efficiency. Okay, so if we could go into uh, semi-annual extraction filings, please. Here's all the records that have been received by the agency for this particular COM code. Uh, even there's a corrected bill in there that is a little bit different than just the semi-annual statements. Um, and this one goes back to 2000-2. If we could go into the 2011-2, please. Okay, this is probably the most used function that's, that's going to be part of this system. This is the semi-annual reporting. Every six months, the agency is going to create these records. They're going to be submitted out to the operators, and the operators can log into this system and file their, their uh, statements electronically. Can you scroll down, please? As you can see, I started this semi-annual already. It's got each of the wells that uh, this operator owns, and it's going to keep track of the meter readings as time goes by so that there's, there's less chance for errors. And as we cha make a change, can you change the current reading on the first well, please, and tab? Okay. As he tabs through that, you'll notice, or maybe you don't notice because it happens so quickly, but the acre-feet extraction is actually calculated as he goes through that, as is the extraction charge, the surcharges, and the total credits and allocation remaining down in the, the lower right. So on this particular com code, I can see that uh, I had 154 credits when I started, give or take, and I've expended just over 300, so... I have um, 113 acre feet that's going to get an extraction charge of $4, and then I have 189 acre feet that is subject to a surcharge. All of this is calculated um, dynamically, and it's assigned to the operator at the time. So, Scott, if you can go into the efficiency application, please. Now, this system is going to expect that the irrigation efficiency is filed at the same time that the semi-annual statement is filed. And what I've done is I've, I've added the extractions that this, this water is used for based on what wells, and I've added, um, uh, we have the ability to add water purveyors, which I did not, um, and then I selected Camarillo just as a test case. 
and put in my crop type and the, the amount of acres. Once I've got the amount of acres in there, remember we were looking at the ETL report, so when Sheila types in the, the allowed water, it's feeding into this calculation and coming up with the allowed HTO per crop. So if I've got 500 acres of avocado and my allowed water is 2.116, then I've got 1,058 allowed acre feet. So Scott, if you could scroll down and please um, stop right there. The calculation that is being used is, is on the screen where we've got 1,058 of allowed water. The actual water applied, we get a, an efficiency percentage of 90.732%. Please um, submit this. Oh, no. Sorry. Can you add extractions to the missing wells, please? Just zeros? and then submit. You might have to delete the crop, the empty crop. Okay, so now that we, we have selected this, the system knows that I didn't upload a map because every year you have to upload a map of, of the crops that you've been running but we can mail that in later. It's not going to stop the application. So please return to the semi-annual statement. And what this system is going to do is it's going to assume that if you filed an irrigation efficiency, then it's going to be approved by the Fox Canyon Board, and it's going to correct the amounts due. So as you can see at the bottom here, the 2011-2 surcharge has been erased because the efficiency has now been filed. So this should... Hopefully, our hope is that, that by having this system out there that, that we'll be able to manage the surcharges better, we'll be able to manage the irrigation efficiencies better, not we, Fox Canyon, will be able to manage those better. And um, it's instead of carrying a negative credit balance or what they used to refer to as surcharge credit balances, this system is going to calculate those surcharges in real time and allow the, the operator to pay them there. And Scott, if you could file this statement, please. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my fault. Can you go back to the operator's homepage, please? And if we go into semi-annual extractions, it's still in a safe state. Okay. Go back to the home screen, please. Additional notifications that this one has is it's got an application in pro progress. It's got some applications that are approved. Can we go into the approved applications, please? These are the irrigation efficiency applications that, that have been received for this account from, from the operator in Fox Canyon. So all of these records have been brought in. All of the payments have been brought in. All the extraction history credits everything. All of that data is now available for uh, the GMA staff to run their reporting and their statistics and trends on, on the water as well. And that's, that's the demo that I wanted to give today. Any questions? Okay. Now, you said the, you said the system is actually online. It is. Is it online purely in a test mode, or can we actually start filing uh, real data? It is online, and the, the staff in the agency has been using it for a while. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, there's a pilot program coming up. All right, so maybe we need to, uh, well, first of all, before we go to the pilot program, anybody have any quick questions? I just, I just want yes, a quick question. The, um, I know it's going to be available, but uh, how about the user or operator training for the, for the system, number one? And number two, tech assistance, you know, once they start using the program, who do they call for assistance? Yes, yeah. there will be operator training available. Yeah. And for assistance, they're going to first call Fox Canyon staff. And mm -hmm. if Fox Canyon needs support, if there's a bug in the system or there's something wrong, mm -hmm. then they're going to call us. And, and I think we'll, the, we'll the other quick answers. question, and you're probably going to answer it, when a user starts using a well, if, if I'm using that correct. Who inputs the, the base amount that they, they're going to use to compute their allocation and so forth? Am I? 
the, the, the base amount of the historical allocations, yeah, yeah. that's input by agency staff. By agency staff. Mm -hmm. It's already there. It's already there. So they start right. from there. And on the current on the right. current paper form, it when you get your... It's uploaded to... Yeah, it's on the paper form. But your previous input is on the paper form, and you're just adjusting from your previous. So then the user can compare that with uh, whatever he's inputting to make sure that... Exactly. He should be able to pull out to his compare. records from any history that he filed from and compare it to the and, system. And in the future, once they do it uh, electronically, then that data is used to compare it to the next reporting cycle. Is that... Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hi, Steve Nash. And I, I apologize. I, I, I probably missed this. But is, is this strictly um, for in-house use, or is the database um, available to the, uh, to the general public? It's available to the operators and owners, as well as the Fox Candy staff. So not so the public can't access. No, it's private information. Okay, because as far as things like alloc you know allocations and extractions, and uh, uh, the amount of, of, of credits, you know, that's that's certainly information that, that I would find useful. But I, I can understand. Let me squeeze in. Right. Yeah. We, Steve, we the agency does produce an annual report every year with a lot of that information in it already. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, it's available, but it's in, available in that format. And then one other thing I wanted to mention, Mary went through the irrigation efficiency. There's also an internal workflow for that. They are approved as they're submitted, um, but there's an internal review where staff looks at them and does the final approval. Okay. So if there's an issue, it gets kicked out, and then the operator's notified. <laughs> You know, you may owe a surcharge. Okay. All right. Before before I let Tom speak, real quick, uh, Tom Smith, City of Camarillo. How how far back is the historical data going to be uh, available? It goes all the way, right? 1983. 1983. Okay. okay. All right. Now let, let's um, th thank you for your your uh, demo. Now let's get on to the uh, process of how we're going to bring this thing online. Could we and have the what's the time please? frame? Here's a time frame uh, that I put together. So the next 30 days, we're going to do, we're going to roll in the pilot testing. We included a notice in the semi-annual newsletter, and we also got some input from the last board meeting. So we're developing a list of pilot testers. We want to get that done in the next 30 days, finalize the remaining data issues, and, and get to project closeout. Next, mid Mid-March to the end of March, we'll do another limited parallel system test. We're not going to keep doing these things over and over for every single account. We're going to pare it way down to a list of representative accounts. We'll do another parallel system test and address any issues three months prior to when these things need to go out in the mail. We're going to work to start enrolling more users in FCGMA Online in May through June. Okay. Uh, additional training for those users would be, say, mid-July through July 30th. And the next step, there's another issue. We're going to have to kick off the programming changes for the new Irrigation Allowance Index. That'll start end of July through the end of August. One more limited parallel system test three months prior to when these things need to go in the mail to make sure everything's working right. And then the next big issue coming up, you'll see it way out there on the bottom, is when the Irrigation Allowance Index calculations need to be up and running. So that'll be when people file in, in January or February 2014. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions on that time timeline? Yep. John? Just one question. The, uh, I'm sure this is going to be mandated. Is there a timeline for all users to, to get online? Well, right now the direction from the board is that it's voluntary, so we're working to roll in voluntary, you know, participants right now. I, I heard, um, Lynn, you may not even remember it, but it stuck in my mind over a year ago. You thought maybe moving forward with irrigation efficiency, we make that a, a, an online only application. I, I think, John, the answer to the question is is that this project um, has taken a lot longer than we th thought it was. Mm -hmm. We spent close to $100,000 with the count, uh, 
if I recall, or higher than that. Yeah, a little higher. Um, anyway, it's taken a lot longer than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, it's more complex than I think we ever envisioned. The county is changing, as you indicated. The county is changing. Some accounting, there's there are all kinds of changes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we've actually said yet that the cutoff date is X. Mm -hmm. I think that our strategy is now that we've got some test pilot going on is to push as hard and as fast as we can and when we get feedback on that over the next few months of how it's been going then I think we're in a position to say okay the cutoff date is X and I think long term the solution is that everything should be done online it's it's part of our process to save money because the cost of doing uh, paper process is very expensive. I know in the county we are doing that, you know, to yeah. integrate all the agencies to, to save money. The, the other last quick question is, uh, so you're going to have some people online and, and some other people manually, then how do you, you how do you uh, input the, the manual? Do, you, do we do it, the staff going to do that to compute the total usage and so forth? Well, for those that do not do it online, we'll essentially be doing it the, the old way but we'll be using the new system and we'll be manually inputting the data. Which in effect is a test in, in it's itself. A test. It's a concurrent type. Uh, yeah. okay. the, the only difference between staff putting it in, we've educated staff to be very good at it. Um, I think part of the pilot testing program to see if, you know, if we knuckleheads out there in the community can work our way through it. And that's where we'll test even the support process and then have to give some thought to uh, little vignettes or um, uh, a video or whatever uh, so the whole the whole process of training will come out of this uh, testing process mm -hmm. so I, I think it's a good process I think it's the future we're gonna have to do it you know, eventually because I know the county is getting all agencies online and in order to save uh, time and be more efficient and, and so forth so yeah I think it's a, it's a did, good process. Dave did you have a question you looked at me like you had a question Okay, I misread the tea leaves then. <laughs> Mike, hey, uh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you. You talked to us before there was some problem being with multiple crops in the same parcel in the same year. So if you had somebody who um, had four different vegetable crops on, on the same property, you know, a 60 to 90 day turnover, I didn't see that that looked like it was possible on the demo. Um, you know, I, how have you resolved that or have you? I, I assume you're talking about the irrigation efficiency application where you're entering in the crops, sorry, where you're entering in the crops into the irrigation efficiency application? Yeah, I mean, if you have somebody who has a cabbage and then they follow that with lettuce and next they follow it with carrots and some... Yeah, I mean, the system doesn't care how many crops you work with but each of those crops has a different efficiency yes each of them does so you're going to give 60 days to one and 90 days to the next one and how are you working that out no it goes by the acreage and the allowed water per acre i think mike maybe maybe, the maybe i'm oversimplifying well under the current existing irrigation efficiency model um we don't make that kind of delineation but that was one of the things but, but down there, if you look at his schedule, when they start loading up the irrigation allowance index and it starts addressing that issue, that's an issue you're going to have to address that, that the time cycle for these crops are not six months, particularly mm. if they're veggies, they're not six-month crop cycles. Most of them are no longer direct seed. Uh, you know, you're using transplants, so you're, from the day the plant goes in the ground until you harvest it might be 60 days. Yeah, there will be there will be a lot of when it's redeveloped to handle the new irrigation allowance index. That'll all be programmed into it to handle those multiple crops. So if you had something that didn't use much water, maybe like onions, and we follow that with cabbage. Right? Well, you can't use an average between the crops. You take four crops, divide it by four, and call that the average for the year. That won't work. Under the current irrigation efficiency program the people that are reporting to us I think for most cases 
aren't splitting out the, the multiple crops Correct. throughout the year. They're just reporting one crop, and that turns out under the current program to... With the new efficiency program? No, with the, the old. With the existing. Well, that's... But I think concurrent with all this, we're going to the new efficiency program, yes. are we not? Right. So now the devil's in the detail. Right. It'll have to be... Reprogrammed to handle well, the I think uh, if I might index. interrupt, Rick, uh, there's two different discussions going on here. One's about the new program and one's about the current. I think if I heard Mary right, the current program will do what you're talking about, Dr. Kelly. I think she said it will do four, five, six different crops. You put them in, and it will do the, it will assign the appropriate, um, uh, well. Okay, now you're referring to the old system. Right. And then but in the we're new living one, in the future. The new one's going to have to be adjusted in all sorts of ways when we get there. Because, you know, like, it doesn't seem that in the computer world that we, a box is allowed for other crops to be on. Well, let, let's, uh, um, I'm, Can I have one more question? Yes. Um, one of the original design criteria on this was portability. Have we lost that by integrating so much with the new GIS and PayPal and all the integrations? Well, no, we, we didn't lose it, but we knew then that, if we relied on the county GIS, if we did pull it out of the county. We, well, we were aware of that. Right. But I mean, what, what is the, what, the what OS are you running on? There? It's portable. But what operating system did we end up having under this? The system will run on Microsoft servers. So Microsoft, Microsoft Server 2000 right. or whatever it is? Yeah, we've got it on 2003 right now. Okay. And a SQL Server 2000 back end. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let not, I, uh, Charlotte just handed me her, her note. She has council meeting at 4, So, and we've, we've got some other items to deal with. Um, I, I think the, the message we're hearing is, is that it's taken us longer than we anticipated. It's much more complex than we anticipated. We're going to do some pilot testing. Some of these issues that you've raised and others raised will come out of that pilot testing. We're going to set a deadline sometime in the future when we see how the pilot testing program goes out. I think the board uh, is committed to having a electronic database to simplify the paper ring process, but the devil is in the detail, and we're going to have to work our way through it. I thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Scott, for being able to click and follow what she was talking about. Is there anybody else have any quick question on this issue so I can keep moving along here? Anything else? Anything else you wanted to say or talk about? Um, so, I, 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 yes, ma'am. I have my uh, uh, form at the house. I haven't actually looked at it because I got to do it this week, and um, I'll submit into the pilot project and see if I can get it to work. So we'll see how that goes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I do. Um, Dale Zarowski with the Farm Bureau. I just have one quick question. Is this new electronic uh, reporting system going to be online and ready to merge with the new allocation efficiency? Is the timelines of those two merging so the two are going to meet up? Well, same? according to his, according to his schedule, um, uh, uh, 250 days out, somewhere in there, uh, they're going to start kick off the programming changes for the irrigation allegation index. So it is going to transition over to that new system. We're co operating under current uh, efficiency protocol. We've spent a lot of money with Dr. Stiles to come up with new irrigation efficiency protocol. That's being phased into it, and that's why we have to go through all this testing. So to set a time. The answer is yes. Okay. Anything else on this item? Uh, I think I need a recommendation to receive and file. Okay. Recommendation to receive and file. So Second. moved. And hearing no objection, it's approved. Yes. Next item. Uh, let, let, me, let me do this if I may. Can I make another quick change? These items that we're going to cover, uh, Brian, if you'll bear with me for a second. These items we're going to cover are informational items. We have one action item. With the, with the indulgence of the board, given your schedule, what I'd like to do is deal with, you folks have been patiently waiting, um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to deal with this proposed settlement agreement while we have a full board here, deal with that issue. Um, take as much time as we need, and then that opens up us to deal with the information items. You, you folks okay with that? Everybody okay with that? All right. 
So, uh, Gerhardt, let's deal with item number six. Can you bring up item number six, the presentation, please? And we'll and I'll work our way through this, all of these items, to get to the punchline. Okay? Hello again, board members, uh, Chair Mohart, members of the audience, Gerhard Hubner. I'll be presenting presenting this item, item number six, proposed resolution 2012-1 which is detailing the settlement agreement regarding the Islands Acre Mutual Water Company surcharge offset. Jumping right into it, a little bit of background. Uh, Nylands Acres Mutual Water Company supplies potable water to approximately 1,100 people in 300, with 300 retail connections. Uh, Low-income community, unincorporated portion of the county. They rely on a single water supply well as their sole supply of water, and all the residents were paying a monthly flat fee. Uh, since the mutual was formed back in 1948 uh, until recently, they began to uh, accumulate surcharges back through uh, back to 1997 uh, when they exhausted their available credits. Uh, their annual extractions average approximately 50 to 60 acre feet per year above their allowed uh, allocation limit. Uh, there were some surcharges in that period up through 2005. Uh, the board did make a decision back in June 2009 uh, to set those surcharges to zero. So that moves us forward from uh, that time forward. Looking at the 2006, 2007, 2008 time frame, uh, there were again surcharges. Uh, we came to your board, if you recall, back in March of 2010. We proposed uh, a resolution and a settlement uh, patterned after a similar agreement that had the board approved for Strickland Mutual Water. That uh, agreement, as you recall, was similar but required some additional time. The board did uh, express some some concerns or reservations. They did direct staff to go back and talk with uh, Nyland uh, regarding specifically the completion of more meters, water meters, as well as a tiered water structure. So since then, we've had a number of conversations with uh, Dave Souza, the managing operator of Nyland Acres, as well as John Matthews. Um, since then as well, uh, Nyland Acres has completed 90% of the meters in the community at a cost of $206,000. And they've also, the Board of Directors has adopted a tiered water rate structure by their Board of Directors. And I've included as part of one of the attachments the water rates that became effective January 1st, 2011. That's item 6B. Some additional considerations for today. We understand uh, that recently Nyland Acres has been in communication with the city of Oxnard as well as United Water Conservation District regarding uh, obtaining additional, either additional allocation and or credits for water provided by Nyland Acres to parcels that are annexed to the city. Uh, this allocation or credits could be used to offset the remaining surcharge. So if you look at the total amount of uh, 226000 Minus the 206 that I mentioned, uh, there's, there's $220,124 owed the agency. Uh, and so the proposal that they've been discussing is the transfer of approximately 20 acre feet of good deed trust credits by United. That's the proposal uh, that I have before me today. We've drafted up a resolution for consideration today. Um, with this resolution, this would require Nyland to complete. Uh, the remaining water meters, we believe uh, by adopting this resolution that there's both long-term interest by the agency and the Nylands community for water conservation, water savings with a net benefit to the underlying aquifers. Um, the proposed resolution would document that performance of those things would occur. Again, as drafted, the resolution would allow the vast majority of the surcharge owed to the agency to be suspended and subsequently waived uh, with the completion of the meter installation. It does require that all remaining meters be completed and installed by the end of this calendar year and that the remainder of $20,124.37 
And I've added this in bold because this is a, a proposed addition that we've added to the resolution for your consideration today, or an equivalent number of credits uh, would be owed to the agency within 60 days to account for that remaining balance. Again, the uh, surcharge would only be waived if uh, these conditions are met, payment of uh, uh, or proof of payment that the remaining water meters and infrastructures was completed. We got progress reports twice a year with the semi-annual statements and then a final completion report at the end of the year. Uh, conclusion, we believe that both the meter installation and uh, the uh, and completion of this, as I mentioned before, does have benefit to the agency, does allow the uh, entire amount to be suspended uh, and or waived. There are uh, three options, of course. I always like to present some options for you. Of course, uh, you have the resolution before you. You can adopt that. You could reject the resolution and direct staff to renegotiate a new settlement, or you could deny the appeal and require Nyland to uh, pay the full amount or a portion of that amount. But our recommendation today is that you adopt uh, the proposed resolution 2012-1 with the additional language of under number one uh, and what's in bold that that additional language be added to the resolution. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Anybody have any board member have any questions? Uh, Dave, did you want to say anything? Or somebody? Anybody? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Mulhart, members of the board. Uh, I'm an associate of John Matthews, as you know, and today I'm here <coughs> representing Nyland. Um, not here to uh, I'm actually glad to be here today. I'm not here to argue or, or request. Uh, I'm here to support and thank. Uh, I think this is a, a reasonable resolution. I would, I would ask you to, to please support it. Um, we're well aware of the patience and the cooperation with which this board and the staff has handled the Nyland situation. We're very appreciative of that. Uh, to date, this uh, community, which is a unique community, they're economically disadvantaged, has uh, ponied up about a quarter of a million dollars for the meters. Um, those that have been metered that we have information for, their uh, usage has dropped substantially. Um, and uh, our main concern with the resolution was coming up within 60 days with $20,000 because the coffers of this uh, mutual companies uh, is, are, are empty. So we were trying to come to you today with a solution to that, some, because we know that this agency wants to bring this particular matter to a close, and it's time that it does after a couple of years. Um, our uh, negotiations with City of Oxnard were very productive, but as of yesterday, I, I couldn't get a hold of them, and it looked as if they might have stalled. So I uh, had the idea of calling uh, a gentleman who I know uh, is, well, I know him to always want to do the right thing. I explained the urgency, uh, so I gave Mike Solomon a call, and I'll let him speak uh, hmm. at this point. I'm sure he's pleased to do so. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> he uh, indicated there might be, with board, subject to board approval, an opportunity to transfer credits from the Good Deed Trust to take care of this $20,000 balance, which would give this community a fresh start and put this matter to rest, which I think is a win-win for everybody. Okay, very good. Dan? I'm uh, Dan Nauman with uh, Nauman Family Farms and Bunnett Talking here for United. I uh, think this is the right process to uh, go. Dan, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I believe this is the right process to go to use a good deep trust. I think this is a good example of that. And uh, we're going to take it uh, to our board and for the February uh, with, uh, I'm sure that will be passed with uh, with uh, flying colors. So with that, I'd like to just say that I would, I would accept to go ahead and move forward with the resolution presented today. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Yes. Mr. Chair, uh, so... United will come up with the, with the credits. Is that Mr. Solomon? Well, I understand, of course. Yeah, yeah. But we believe, we believe yeah. it's a proper use of the credits, and it should be a problem. This is a good example of what the good trust. And, 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 and I think wait, wait, we, can't, we can't have a mic. You got to come no. up. I mean, 
And I think Charlotte's Mike, reminding me that we got to get you on tape. People at home are going, what is that voice in the back of the room? So, and, and Mike, I think... Uh, Who's committing votes yeah. that haven't been taken yet? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me share with you. I think that's a, yeah. that's a great partnership that you're going to take that to, yeah. to your board. Yeah. So, again, Mike Solomon, General Manager, United Water Conservation District. I have talked with Lynn and uh, Dan... Uh, who are representatives on the GMA board, talk to Jeff Pratt. We all agree that this is a very appropriate use of the Good Deed Credit Trust. Again, the Good Deed Credit Trust is the state water we bring down the Santa Clara River, and it's only the water that makes it to the Freeman Diversion and provides water for the Oxnard Plain. This is an inter it, it is not an inner basin transfer. It, that water is used for the entire Oxnard Plain. So this is a great use for it. So we will recommend it, and I don't believe we'll have any problem getting it approved. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Chair, you know, yeah. I have met, you know, with uh, with Dave and, and John, you know, with with the city of Moxford, and I, we were working on that, but uh, it didn't quite happen. But I'm glad you came up, you know. And yeah. yeah. So the, under the uh, mm -hmm. so that we all understand, and then and kind of leads to my question, uh, the. Um, the Good Deed Trust requires two boards' approval. It requires the approval of the GMA board, and it requires the approval of the United Board. I'm confident with Mike that the United Board will approve this. It's logical. It's consistent with what the whole intent of that program is, is about. The question I have is, and it's, if we approve this resolution, are we, in effect, giving the approval to transfer our vote as approval for the Good Deed Trust, or do we have to do that as a separate item as well? That would need to come back to your board. It could be as a consent item, but the resolution as presented is more general than that. Okay. And, and I think the idea was to give, to leave open the option that the uh, transfer of credits from the city could occur. Okay. So uh, from a sequence of events standpoint, if we adopt the resolution as recommended by staff, with the additional change or the equipment number of credits, mm -hmm. um, it will be on the February um, United uh, February eighth and February eighth United, United agenda. I don't see a problem, and we'll have to put it then on the February GMA agenda. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the folks in Nylon Acres, if they want to come up with twenty thousand dollars, they could circumvent that. I don't see that happening. So we we would approve this, and then it would it would all fall apart in theory if the United Board and or the GMA Board does not act on it within the February or in the 60-day time frame. Is that is that the correct sequence? Yeah. Now, yeah. subject to. There's a lot of flexibility with enough time frame for the parties to get together, the boards to act. Okay. It, it really depends when Bob gives me my check. I, so, yeah. I'm <laughs> so, Bob, are you okay with that? You, yes, I'm good with that. Uh, Chairman Mohart, I just wanted to say that today I put in the hands of our client, Nyland, uh, a proposed uh, letter that would be sent to both the GMA and to United as required, laying out what okay. we believe are the reasons uh, to justify this. Uh, it'll go to their uh, board of directors for approval, and upon getting that approval, we'll get separate letters uh, Requesting to okay. both of you. Okay. All right. Do any of the members have any questions? Um, I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. My, my comment goes back to what he said that since the tiered rate structure was adopted, uh, water usage has dropped substantially. And I'm, I'm really happy to see that. I had supported that when we discussed it before because I strongly feel that when people see how valuable their resource is and what it's costing, uh, they start using less of it than when they just have a low flat rate every month. It doesn't mean anything to them, so yeah. I'm, I'm really happy to see that. I, and, and I would even echo uh, on what you said. Not only did you come up with a tiered rate structure, but as you actually look through it, it's a very complicated and, and all-inclusive rate structure. How you ever got everybody to agree to that, I have no idea. But when you go through all of the different scenarios, um, my hat's off to you for coming up with an agreement that addresses the reality that that it's a precious resource and it's got to be paid for. So my compliments to you on that one. And Mr. Chair, you know, I, I also want to comp compliment the uh, the uh, agency or the the water district for, and I think they were using the Oxnard rate, the model rate for, for Oxnard, and uh, and I commend them for that too. You know, I, uh, 
So do you need a motion for that? I need a motion to, unless there's any other questions. I'll move to like it. No. All right. Yes, sir. Hold on. Hi, Steve Nash again. And I just want to say that once again, I think you're setting a precedent and a policy that will come back and bite you in the, in the behind. Where do you draw the line, and how do you set the threshold to define a needy community? Um, I know in my own in my own town of Oxnard, we certainly have pockets that, of of um, low income people that are uh, as economically disadvantaged as, as anybody in Island Acres, and yet, you know, I uh, anticipate that we will be facing double digit increases for a number of years on both our wastewater rates and our water rates. Where will we go to, uh, to uh, seek uh, relief? Will, will, will you come forward and, and uh, offer, offer the same deal to the residents of Oxnard as, as you are to an island acres? And I think that this, you know, what is, what is the whole point of, of penalties and surcharges if, if you know, you're willing to waive them at the drop of a hat? And I, you know, I do appreciate the, the, uh, the uh, economic realities of Nyland Acres, um, but still, you know, we have to have some kind of uniformity in the application of, of the uh, policies of, of the GMA. Thank you. Okay. Um, hey, hold on, John. Hold on. Let me, let me hear this. I would like to ask a question. Maybe you can direct staff, legal staff. You're going to pass a resolution with items that are being discussed that have been discussed in the last two days. This is a copy of your staff report. I see no change in the resolution, no, no evidence that anything has been submitted that there's a change. There's the mention of United Water, the city of Oxnard. It's not in here. It doesn't have getting, to be. It, 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 right. it doesn't have to Excuse me, I have the time. Well, we no, hold, 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 hold on. Okay. Let, let's let's okay. slow down here, okay? The slow down. United and the GMA on that issue don't have to be in here. Okay. Okay. We just heard from legal counsel that that will be at a subsequent meeting. It doesn't change this document. So let's ask the question you just raised. Can we make this amendment and still adopt this ordinance? Yes. And okay. it is a Brown Act concern that, that is being touched on, which is that the proposal that this be alternatively resolved uh, by use of the good deed, good deed trust credits was not agendized, and that's why that would need to come back to your board for a uh, decision later on the use of good deed trudges. credits credits yes credit. because as as presented the resolution the proposed settlement may still require payment of the twenty thousand dollars if that approval of the use of the credits is not given okay so we can adopt this with the changes but the issue of us giving consent to using the good deed credits has to be agendized and will be done at the february meeting is that correct I assume at that meeting or the next one. Okay. Chair, if I might, there, there would be no changes. What we're adopting is a resolution in front of us. And in the meeting to come, if those changes are presented, then we decide on what those changes are. Okay. Right? Are subject to? Um, so my concern, so Mr. With my concern, which the attorney did address, you're adopting something that has not been agendized. The Brown Act issue, I believe, is an issue in this case. But would it not be getting the cart before the horse because you are hoping... And it sounds as if these will be passed with the Fox Canyon, with the uh, United Water, and the various other entities. You're hoping that that will be passed. If it doesn't, do we rescind this? That's why I'm asking if it's getting the cart before the horse. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. And the answer to that is no, because the settlement is in the alternative, either payment of the or remaining surcharges or use of credit. Okay. All right. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Any other comments? All right, can we have, I need a motion then. I would move. He just took it away. Uh, well, <laughs> he took the added language away. Staff recommendation. Okay. I would move to uh, adopt the, the resolution as presented in the packet, but with the addition of uh, the the added language up there or equivalent number of credits. And a second that. Okay. There's the motion and a second. Roll call, please. Chair Mulhart? Yes. Director Craven? Yes. Director Zaragoza? Yes. Director Kelly? Yes. Director Borchard? 
Yes. But okay. Mr. Chair, can I yes. real quick? You know, I, I think uh, this is really important, this partnership, you know, that we assist the uh, folks over in Island Acres. And there's a couple of reasons. It's a safety reason, number one, and also we're trying to help the individuals there that need that water desperately so. And, and also the other thing that they're doing is they're metering and using the tier rate in order to save water that's going to help us with their with the Fox uh, Canyon's uh, concerns. So I think it's a win-win situation all the way across. So I just oh. want to share that. Okay, very good. Let's go to item number three. I'd just like to congratulate Bob and Dave on their successful implementation of a tiered rate structure. We, we might have a job for them in the Las Posas Basin <laughs> yeah. in the future. Uh, for the record, uh, Brian Bondi, hydrogeologist with the GMA. Item three is our Las Posas Basin update. By the way, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, there's two parts of the update. One is to give you an update on our status of pursuing the Proposition 84 planning grant for the engineering study for the basin, and then our regular update on the basin-specific planning process. In terms of the Prop 84 grant status, uh, in December you'll recall that your board approved uh, staff's request to pursue a grant for an engineering study for the basin. The purpose of this study would to be to determine the most cost-effective suite of infrastructure necessary for ag users to pump, desalt, and convey shallow aquifer groundwater in the basin. That is the, the key cornerstone of the solution for the Las Posas Basin management issues is making use of that water. So this is an important study. Uh, subsequent to the board meeting, we participated in the project selection process that it was held by the Watershed Coalition of Ventura County. This is the group that is authorized to apply for grants under Prop 84 for the Ventura region. This was a competitive process. We competed against six other projects in the region, and I'm happy to report that ours was one of two selected uh, to be put in the overall application for the region to go forward. So uh, our next step is to prepare the application that is due in March to the Department of Water Resources. We will be working with the other successful project, which is the Salt and Nutrient Management Plan for the Santa Clara River Valley, which is conveniently being headed up by Gerhardt and the Watershed Protection District. But what's so, the potential dollar value of this grant? The, for the region, there was approximately 500000 available. Our project proposal is rest, requesting 120000 Okay. For a total $200,000. It's a, a match. Yes, our match would be partially coming in cash from Cayagas Municipal Water District, our project partner, as well as in-kind services from within the agency staff labor. Okay. So the next step is to prepare a single application for our region and the application costs. Uh, we will be hiring a consultant to help us prepare that. Cayagas has agreed to pay for the consultant fees. So in terms of financial impact to the GMA, it will be limited to the time that I spend uh, helping prepare this application over the next month or so. Any questions on the grant status and where we're heading? Nope. Okay. What I'd like to do in terms of our update for the basin management plan is just take this opportunity here. It's the beginning of the year. We rewind a little bit and just remind folks what, what it is that we've been working on uh, over the last year. Um, back last January, uh, this group set out to do a number of things. Uh, obviously, we're working on developing a basin-specific management plan. But in terms of what that includes, our goals were to prepare a document that includes a summary of the basin conditions and identify data gaps. We've done that. We set out to identify and describe the key groundwater management challenges in the basin. We've done that. We also set out to develop groundwater management goals and objectives. In other words, what do we want this plan to accomplish? We've accomplished that. Your board has reviewed those and uh, indicated a general agreement with, with what those goals and objectives state. We've also developed quantitative basin management objectives. I'll talk more about what those are in the next item, but basically those are quantitative metrics that you use to evaluate whether or not your basin goals are being met. We've identified a number of basin management strategies I'll remind you about in a moment. And we've developed a draft implement implementation plan for how we would go about putting those management strategies in, in effect. Just real quick, I want to remind you about the key issues in the basin that the plan is attempting to address. address. One of them is a plume of marginal quality water in the south 
and East Las Posas Basins, shown in here in red. This is an area where groundwater chloride concentrations are in excess of 200 uh, milligrams per liter in some cases and are problematic for avocado and berry growers. Other constituents are also problematic for municipal water suppliers. Things like sulfate and hardness are an issue for the Waterworks District. Um, this plume emanates from the shallow aquifer, which basically underlies the Arroyo Las Posas, which is flowing through the valley here and then out to Camarillo. As water moves through the shallow aquifer, it migrates down into the Fox Canyon aquifer and then north underneath and into the East Las Posas Basin. So this is not a static plume. This plume of water is moving. We anticipate that it will move at least another mile or so into the central part of the basin where we have our pumping trough uh, in this basin. So it will reach the middle of that pumping trough and then it won't be able to flow uphill towards the other side of the basin. Our immediate need is to develop a means for providing high quality water for pumpers to blend with in the affected area. One approach would be to produce water by desalting the shallow aquifer, again in this area, and delivering that water to users in affected areas. Long term, we need to improve the quality of the surface water that's recharging the shallow aquifer and ultimately the deeper aquifers. And this will be accomplished by implementation of the salt TMDL as well for the Cuyahoga Creek watershed, as well as pumping and desalting the shallow aquifer and using that water to replace pumping in other areas of the basin. What we hope to do is increase percolation of storm water into the aquifer, which is higher quality. So over long term periods of decades, we should be able to gradually improve water quality through the basin. In the western Las Postas Basin, the, is the key issue is a pumping depression. This area has a long history of depressed water levels. This issue is caused by concentrated pumping in this area by a number of entities, as well as the fact that we have a fault structure in this area that is blocking flow from the east. So there's no water movement into this area of large pumping. The result is a pervasive history of declining water levels. And the problem with having an area of low pressure, by the way, this is minus 125 feet below sea level. Uh, just a sort of a historical note, at its deepest point, this was over 200 feet. And at one point in time, it was the deepest pumping depression in the agency. So this is not a, a small issue. This is uh, a rather, uh, has a potential for being a rather large issue. The concern... Um, no, no, back up. That, was, that at one time was the deepest pumping depression in the agency, on, not in that basin. In the agency, on par with the deepest pumping depressions in the Pleasant Valley Basin, yes. On par, deeper then, equal to? At the time. At the time, deeper. Yeah. Wow. That, that was at 200 feet below sea level? It, it approached. That was and what year was that last? Uh, it stopped declining in about the mid-90s when the in-lieu water delivery program began, and we turned off some of the pumping in that area. We've seen it rise since. Um, but again, that in-lieu program has ended, and we've seen evidence that water levels are starting to go down again. So, Mr. Chair? Yeah. So what's the difference uh, in height between the west and east in that depression? Uh, 300 feet. This 300 is minus 125, and you go across the fault, 180. So we have 300 feet of water level difference. That's a difference. That's, it's, it's, that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the concern with the pumping depression is anytime you have low pressure in an aquifer, you're inviting water to move in from other areas. We have evidence uh, from wells in the basin, Director Kelly's well, that uh, due to well failure at shallower depths, we have evidence that there's poor quality water up above. So you have a situation where you have low pressure, you have water at higher pressure above it, it's only a matter of time before you start seeing changes in water quality. So there's an incentive to stabilize first and then raise these levels to try and prevent the migration of poor quality water into this area. Could, uh, 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 in, the, in the future on the, your slide, as a point of reference, if, if you could mark some of the key cross streets there so I have some sense sure. of where the different roads are. Right. Brad, I mean, I, I generally know where Somas is and the like, right. but uh, just give me some okay. reference of where that fault line is. Can do, and just for now, the Bradley Road is coming right up through here. Okay. So this is... Put your, put your dot on Somas, if we're in agreement. Somas area. Okay. This is the Camarillo Hills, city of Camarillo. And I, I, I don't, 
I don't fully get the scale. So near Somas is the n nut house and all that yeah, machinery all, shop. Yeah, it's all so this is well west of that. Yeah. Lewis Road and, and 118. Where is that? 34 is Lewis and 118. Yeah, 34 okay, 18, Lewis. 34 yeah. is labeled here. 118 is labeled yeah. here coming through. Yeah, I see that. <clears throat> so here's the four bay. Yeah, okay. Just some cross streets would be helpful to highlight. The nut house would be right about where the uh, 100 and... 100 foot level, the yeah. minus 100, yeah. where that touches 118, that would be approximately Bradley Road. It's okay. not house. In All 118. Right. All right. So uh, we're hoping that we can shift some pumping away from this area. In fact, we've already started that. Waterworks District 19 has moved some of their pumping to the East Las Posas Basin, and we're eager to see what kind of a response, a stabilization response, we hope to see here. Uh, ultimately, uh, Water produced by desalters in the eastern and southern Las Posas basins might provide a source of water to further uh, alleviate uh, pumping in this area. So overall, what are the issues that we need to address in the basin? Recap a couple things. We talked just briefly about the pumping depression. We talked about the water quality issues in the eastern Las Posas basin, the need in the short term to provide blend water to lower chloride concentrations. Longer term, we need a solution that over time improves the water quality in the aquifer itself. Um, in both basins, we need some mechanism to address uh, potential growing demand for groundwater and a mechanism to keep the basins in balance. Uh, one way to do this is to develop some sort of pumping uh, allocation or management approach that's tied to a program that brings replacement water into the basin when the water balance is uh, in the negative. Um, we also need to develop an improved plan uh, for how the ASR, the aquifer storage and recovery facility operated by Cayagas, uh, can coexist with other pumpers in the basin. And those, so those are all things that this plan is uh, looking to address. When we started this process last year, early on, we recognized that there would be many questions that could not be answered right away. And we also recognized that we will not be able to implement desalting projects until the Cayuga salinity management pipeline is constructed. That's currently scheduled to be around 2016. So we developed three planning horizons uh, with all of that in mind. The short-term planning horizon or short-term strategies uh, include a number of interim measures like the four acre feet per acre cap that was part of Ordinance 8.6, which your board adopted back in December. Uh, a strategy to shift some pumping out of the West Las Posas Basin that I described earlier that's being implemented by Waterworks District 19. And things like taking steps to address data gaps. Uh, the short term strategies also included uh, a list of planning tasks that we need to carry forward after we adopt this plan. So we've listed out the things that we need to do to put the ducks in the road and actually be able to implement medium-term and longer-term strategies when the opportunities or need becomes available, or when the need, if the need's available for the longer term, when the opportunity uh, is available with the brine line for the medium-term strategies. I'd just like to highlight uh, some of the interim planning tasks that are listed out in our draft plan. Uh, the reason I'd like to do that is because this is where we've been spending most of our time at the users group meetings in the last two months or so. Um, we've been talking about the need to develop these halting and conveyance options. So what is the plan going to say about that? Uh, we've been talking, obviously, about pursuing this grant to obtain funding to do an engineering study. That's one piece of it. We need to understand how to move water through the basin to different ag users and how to do that cost effectively. Um, we're also probably going to be looking at developing a subcommittee of the Las Posas Users Group to tackle the hard questions about how to, to develop the water and move it. So we would need people like Zone Mutual, Burlwood Heights, to participate in this process. They know their systems. I don't understand their systems. They know how to move water. They need to be talking and figuring out how can we get water from point A to point B. That would be the purpose of the infrastructure group. Uh, again, um, with the allocations, we need some sort of mechanism for keeping the basin in balance. What I've listed up here is just one approach. We need an approach for managing the shallow aquifer. Right now, that aquifer is not pumped. It's continually kept full by discharges of wastewater and other uh, surface water discharges from Simi Valley. What we'd like to do is pump that down 
so we can create space to capture first the water from Simi Valley that's leaving the basin. So we actually have a surplus of water. We have water leaving to the Cambrio area. That would be the first phase. Once you've captured those continuous dry weather flows, pump down the shallow aquifer more, create space to capture rain, flow or, uh, rain runoff events, precipitation events. That's where we start to get the water quality benefit. While we're doing all that, we're also increasing the amount of water that's available in the basin for Mr. use. Chair. Yeah. So you pump it out of the uh, that contaminated aquifer to where? First through uh, one or more desalter facilities, and then that gets back to the question of infrastructure. How do we get it to, number one, the people who need it, that's going to be high quality water, the people who need it so that they can blend down their high chloride water that they're pumping. With that water. Okay. With that water. And then if there's surplus beyond that, uh, we the group has not decided the, the priorities for use, but pre presumably to increase the available amount of water in the basin for everyone. Okay. There's a lot of details that need to be worked out. Be worked out. Um, but getting back to pumping down the shallow aquifer, the catch, the catch is the shallow aquifer is a lot like the four bay. Okay, we're able to move water in and out relatively easily, like the four bay. But we also have water moving downward from the shallow aquifer into the deep aquifers where most of the pumping is. So we need to strike a balance. We can't let water levels decline in the basin too much, otherwise we're caught, we could be potentially causing other problems. So there's going to be a need to have a managed approach to how we go about pumping the shallow aquifer. There's a sweet spot, if you will, that we're going to need to try and find. The balance between maximizing additional percolation but maintaining water levels in the basin. So, so when we start thinking about different projects for desalting, it's, it's probably a good idea to have a coordinated approach uh, because if there's an overall basin management effect that can be had by developing that resource. Fourth interim planning task would be to update the ASR operations plan. This is an as-needed thing. This is going to be an evolving uh, situation where Cayugas better learns and better understands how their facility operates. Uh, it impacts uh, water levels in the basin. As they learn more, there may be opportunities to modify the, the first uh, operations plan that we come up with. And lastly, we should start listing out long-term supplemental water options now because those types of projects would be things like inflatable dams or other ways of slowing down or capturing storm water. Anytime you're working in, in a river area, you have a lot of environmental issues and other things. So those projects take a long time, a long lead time to get legs and get going. So if we think there's going to be a need to enhance the ability to percolate water, we're going to need to start working slowly towards developing those types of projects. And these are types of projects that are a decade or more out. So where are we at? Uh, in the last couple of meetings, we've been talking a lot about items number two and number three. Uh, again, number two, the idea there is how do we maintain a balance in the basin? Do we do this with allocations and some sort of water replacement program? Is there another approach? Um, last year, when we decided what the scope of the plan was, we basically decided that we might need to make some changes to the current allocation approach for the agency that's currently in place. We're not sure. Um, there's a lot of questions about costs for supplemental water, how all this, these things are going to work. So we decided that we would not go about tackling that issue head on in this initial plan. In other words, we wouldn't go through an exercise of trying to develop a whole new allocation system. Instead, what we decided was we would talk about some principles. What do we want to accomplish? We've been working through those principles and we've run into a little bit of a challenge in that some of the folks are a little bit uncomfortable talking about how things might work in the future without also knowing the numbers at the same time. So there's been a recommendation to change our approach, and today we decided that what, or what the group decided they would like to do is to modify the scope of the plan slightly. We would not be discussing the principles of the allocation programs for either the deep or shallow aquifer. Instead, what we'd like to do is just get what we have in place in terms of a draft plan completed, through the group, to the board, through the approval process, and then roll up the sleeves and get to work on the, a variety of things, including how we keep the basin in balance, whether that's through allocations or not. 
uh, get on with the business of convening an infrastructure group and starting to work through how do we actually move through water through the basin, the, the real solutions. So it's a minor scope change for the plan, but what it does is it allows us to achieve the milestone of getting an initial plan in place that lays out some implementation steps for us to carry forward. And that's the decision that the group made today. And in terms of schedule, something on the order of three to four months to be bringing this initial plan to you and then moving about our business of implementing our implementation tasks. Uh, is the uh, uh, group still committed to meeting twice a month? Because I, I think that's your current schedule. We are currently meeting twice a month, and okay. it's my intention to continue to meet twice a month if they'll let me do that until we get the plan adopted. Three, did I hear three times a month? Do we have a bid for three? <laughs> well, I mean, today somebody actually meeting? suggested that we, uh, we continue working on the plan and then start talking about pumping management at the same time, and, and I, it, it's just probably not feasible. I think we're at about saturation with what yeah, we No, I'm, I'm being facetious. I, yeah. I, I could send the group up to a big top of the mountain and say, don't come back until you... <laughs> Negotiated out. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, this is an incredibly complex issue. It's a very expensive issue. And what you're trying to do is look into the crystal ball of what the future is. And if we all knew what the future was, you can actually get there. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're blazing a trail. I'm very um, uh, pleased that you're still meeting at twice a month. I was concerned following our December meeting where we you guys worked really hard to give us an issue that we passed in the December meeting that the air could be let out of the balloon. I'm not sensing that. The reports I'm getting back are that today was a very good meeting, was the report I got back today, that uh, it was a very good discussion and you made some headway. So I encourage you to keep going. The two meetings a month uh, is a lot of meetings, frankly, on this mm -hmm. issue. And... Um, as I said earlier, my hope is that you folks can resolve your issues up there, generate it as a, a local solution to a local problem, uh, put it before the GMA, we'll run it up and down the review process, and we'll put it in action, and if that can come as a, um, a model for the Oxnard Plain, they're in the middle of a lot of fluxing because of things the city of Oxnard is doing with the great program and the like. So coming up with answers on the Oxnard Plain right now is problematic because there's too many things in motion. So getting your area solved <coughs> is a great roadmap for how we're going to have to eventually do it on the Oxnard Plain. So um, anyway, very good. I think, again, the report I got back today from some folks was that you guys had a great meeting today. And um, The one thing, Mr. Chairman, I think that Brian has to be complimented. They, you know, we ended up uh, making a decision on the pathway, and there were no objections to. Yeah, that's what I heard. Something. Yeah, so I heard it was a great discussion by a lot of folks. So, um, anybody in the audience have any questions? Yes, sir. Hi, Steve Nash again. Um, replacement water, replacement water. Who has a replacement water? I'm always amused by the analogy of Nero fiddling while Rome burns. This seems to be a, a similar situation. The, um, you know, when the Las Pesas Users Group is still uncertain about how to define safe yield and overdraft, I, I, I do know one thing that when the, when you look at the cost of desalting water, and in the case of Oxnard purifying its wastewater that there will be quite a bit of resistance to the thought of, re -pump, of reinserting that, um, that treated water back into the ground. The, co the, the cost to treat the water is just too great. So, so I'm definitely, you know, I feel, I feel concerned when uh, it's, it's suggested that, you know, desalting the, uh, the water with high chlorides uh, would be a method to, uh, you know, blend it with the, with the, with the, with the uh, uh, not so great groundwater. I think that there would be a lot of resistance to that, just just based on the on on, on the on, on the cost per acre foot of treating that water. Um, you know, when you're talking about, well, again, in the case of Oxnard, it's going to be one one to two thousand dollars per acre foot. There's going to be a lot of resistance to just to, to, you know just spending that money and then putting it back into the, into the ground. So you know, I do I do wish the uh, LPUG 
you know, all of the success in the world, but there are certainly, you know, a lot of problems. So. Thank you. Susan? Susan Mulligan, Cayugas Municipal Water District. I just want to clarify that we're looking at the cost to treat the groundwater out in Las Posas to agricultural standards and including the cost to discharge to the salinity management pipeline at about $500 an acre foot. Now, that isn't great if all the water that an agricultural grower, uh, that a grower um, produces is at that rate, but if some small percentage is at that rate or perhaps you know, that water could be spread out or those costs could be spread out over all water pumped, we think that that's a low enough price that we can find a solution. Um, to treat to municipal standards, you're looking at about $900 an acre foot. But for agricultural standards, it's about 500 okay. So we think it's doable. Okay, thanks. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else on this? All right. Uh, next item, any members? It's an information item. Uh, receive and file? Uh, Second. Okay. Any objection? Uh, hearing none, so move. Let's go to number four. Oh, Brian. <laughs> Try and get this done by four. Uh, you, we've got two things to go through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll spot you uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes. There you go. Clock well, is ticking. I have an escape clause in here yeah. if we need okay. to use it. Item four is our annual uh, base and management objectives progress report. Uh, the purpose of this item is to provide an update on the status of groundwater conditions in the agency and progress towards meeting our agency's basin management objectives. Uh, as you may recall, our basin management objectives, or BMOs for short, are groundwater level or water quality measurements that are defined at specific locations that serve as quantitative performance metrics for evaluating the effectiveness of the strategies that are recommended in our agency's groundwater management plan. So what we uh, what you typically like to do is compare uh, your existing conditions in the aquifers, whether that's levels or quality, to your standards to get a sense of how well your strategies are working. Generally how this works, you have a groundwater management plan. You identify some goals. Some examples of the goals in our agency's management plan are to prevent saline intrusion in coastal areas, protect beneficial uses in Pleasant Valley Basin from saline intrusion, things like that. Then we have our basin management objectives, which again are our quantitative metrics to evaluate whether or not those goals are being met. And of course, we have management strategies that are being implemented to achieve those goals. So just the background on what all this BMO and lingo means. You then go about the business of monitoring, and then periodically you ask the question, are your BMOs met? Uh, if yes, you go back and continue monitoring. If no, at some point, you want to take a hard look at updating your management strategies. So that's the overall framework that is laid out in our uh, groundwater management plan. And so we're just sort of taking, we're not really asking this question, but we're taking a look at where we're at today. In terms of our groundwater management plan goals and BMOs, um, in overdraft situations you're typically faced with, uh, groundwater quality degradation is typically uh, the first type of problem uh, that you have um, before you actually run out of water. Some other things you might run into would be increased pump lifts and subsidence. But our main issues are water related to water quality issues. Uh, the core goals of our GMP are to protect water quality for beneficial uses. And if you're successful at doing that, you're also solving the overdraft issue by definition. Uh, so the two primary goals, if you were to sort of summarize them into two categories, uh, we want to prevent saline intrusion from a variety of, of sources throughout the agency. We also want to protect public supply wells from nitrates in some areas where we have, we have problems. In terms of our uh, BMOs, well, let me back up. I just have a quick indication. The orange areas are showing areas of documented saline intrusion in the upper aquifer system of the Oxnard Plain lower system of the Oxnard Plain. We also know that we have other sources of salts intruding on the eastern side of the Pleasant Valley Basin and coming in to the northern part of the Pleasant Valley Basin from the Las Posas area. And of course, the saline intrusion that we just got done talking about in the Las Posas Basin. Uh, in terms of the BMOs, we have 26 locations, these little white uh, squares with a black dot in the middle. 
And some of these have multiple zones that we look at our indicators at different depths. Uh, so all in all, we have 52 BMOs. Uh, I'm going to start out with just an overall summary of what we've seen in the last couple of years, kind of cut to the chase. Um, last couple of years, we've had above average precipitation, particularly the last water year, 2010 to 2011. You might remember the very uh, wet December that we had. I know I do. I was at Disneyland for three days with a three-year-old and a four-year-old prepaid <laughs> suffering through that big storm event. Um, so long and the short of it, we, we've had above average rain, which has led to some water level rises in the coastal areas, Oxnard Plain, and to some degree in the Pleasant Valley Basin, uh, on the order of 10 to 20 feet in the last couple of years. Well, what this has done is, in a lot of areas, it's largely reversed the water level decline pattern that had established during the three years of dry conditions back in the sort of 2006 to 2009. So a lot of areas have, have largely recovered uh, relative to to that mini, mini drought, if you will. Uh, so many of the downward trends in water levels that we reported last year when we first did these BMO reports are now either flat or in some cases upward trending overall for the last five years. We, we take a five-year look when we talk about trends in these reports. Um, however, um, water levels remain below BMOs at most coastal locations. So we've had some minor improvement but in most of the areas where we have concerns, we are still significantly below our targets, uh, numbers in the 10 to 50 feet range below our targets at a lot of locations. So the bottom line is not much has, has changed. BMO report cards. Uh, why do we do a report card? What is a BMO report card? You should have a, an extra handout there with a number of colored uh, front and back pages for the different basins. Uh, why do we prepare these? Well, the, sim the simple answer is this information isn't really all captured in one place. We have some information in our annual report. We have some in different groundwater conditions reports by United, by the county. But nowhere is that information synthesized and compared to our goals. And that's the purpose of doing this. Um, so we wanted to create a relatively simple communication tool that we could provide to the board, to interested parties on the website so on and so forth, it easily allows people to take a quick snapshot of the area they're interested in and see how things are looking. Uh, the first page of your report card, I'll just run you through the different sections. At the top, it tells you what basin you're concerned with on the particular page. It reiterates the goals from the groundwater management plan. It describes what the BMOs are. There's a written status summary that covers the current year as well as, in some cases, discussion of the trends. And a lot of people would maybe just stop there. Um, we also have a summary status summary table that takes and compares the average uh, either water levels or water quality indicators against the BMO. We have a green light, yellow light, red light type approach here of indicating whether things are good. So you don't even have to look at the numbers. Uh, obviously, green's good, red is bad. And then we indicate five-year trends uh, with arrows and coloring to indicate if that trend is in a good direction or bad direction. So that's how you read them. Uh, we also have a map showing the locations of the BMOs for that particular basin. Page two just includes detailed trends, whether you're plotting water levels, in this case in blue, and chloride concentration. Those are just there for anybody who's interested in more detail, people like Steve and me. Um, at this point, uh, I could either go through and provide a basin by basin status, or if there's a time concern, we could stop at this point. It's a pleasure of the board. Let me, let me ask uh, members, do you have any questions? Yeah. Anybody in the audience have any questions? Yes, sir. I apologize for taking all, all of your time. Um, Steve Nash, and my concern has always been how do we preserve the groundwater basin because to the best of my knowledge we are in an overdraft situation. This is the only source of water we have in the event of a disruption of state water. So my concern is that we not, not only do we not only do we stop the overdraft but we try to reverse it and we try to bring our, our bank account up as 
much as possible just to deal with, with the uh, uh, most uh, adverse of, of scenarios. Now, if this is, this is a, a progress report. I would call it a report card. And if I was, gr if, if I was grading it, looking at the six basins, um, three of the basins have no groundwater level BMOs at all. Um, on the other three, on the other three basins, uh, they're either not the ground, uh, the uh, water level BMOs are either not being met, or uh, are only partially met, uh, depending on which on which well you look at. So, you know, I hate to be chicken little and always be so cynical, but I, I would have to I would have to give this uh, a, uh, a passing, uh, not even a passing grade, a grade of F. So, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right, this is another informational item. Um, by the way, I think, I may be wrong, I, I think this is the first year we've seen this level of detail with the um, color, second year? Okay. Yeah, we, we started right. this process last January. Okay, I, I don't remember it, and that's my own little pea brain, but I like the format. I think it's very easy to read. It tells us we still have a lot of work to do, and we're working in that direction. Um, I don't see any, I don't see from my standpoint any surprises here. It's disappointing, but I don't see any surprises. And, um, and I, as I said, I like the format, so we have to keep plugging away. All right, let's. Uh, that's a receiving file. Sure. It's also good to note that you know this progress, though many would like to see it move along a lot quicker than perhaps is ideal. These are not simple issues, and and uh, I, I do think progress is being made and. There, there's a lot of issues of, of various entities supplies and and so I think cooperatively though they take a long time there is definitely progress being made yeah I, I would absolutely agree with that I mean and um, so you know, it's, um, I need a motion to receive and file so moved. A, sec a second any objection so moved let's go to number five Did oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, very good. Oh, I, I'm way ahead of schedule. Oh, well, <laughs> we have ten minutes to waste here. What would you want to talk about? Baseball scores? Huh? Number um, seven. Number seven. We have uh, administrative items, a whole bunch of items in there, and then our next um, meeting is, uh, where did I do with that piece of paper? February 22nd. Anybody, anybody have anything else before we go? Move to receive and file the administrative reports. Second. Okay, motion to receive and file. Any objection? Uh, hearing none, so moved. Uh, meeting is adjourned till February 22nd. We'll call the chair. Thank you very much.